My name is Elizabeth Peterson. I'm the director of the museum. This is um, my little moment to talk to you about the history and method of color woodcut. Um, before I do, I just want to let you know that next week is our final lecture of the summer series with Rod Hardy of Hardy and Halper and Appraisers. Um, he uh, is going to be talking about um, elegant simplicity in Japanese clay and specifically about the Kerry Lee Jacobs Henderson collection, uh, which you see on view in the Skylight Gallery here. Um, Carrie Lee will be here, I'm happy to tell you, and uh, as will the Taylors, whose beautiful woodcuts are on loan to us. And um, because all the collectors will be here for the first time, we're having a reception after um, this as a sort of a final piece, although the show is open for another month, so <laughs> don't think we're closing it down after this. Okay, so please come next week if you can. Um, I'm going to attempt to tell you about 2,000-year um, history in just a brief period of time. Um, there are a great many sources that I uh, checked with and um, I don't want to say plagiarized, but lifted from very generously, so this, would, this will never be published uh, <laughs> in, in its current form, but here are just a few of them. In addition, um, I checked with the online gallery of the British Library and the Print Perspective um, website, um, in addition to these sources. So the earliest recorded form of printmaking of any kind is relief printing. The very earliest sort of relief printing was woodcut. Uh, I'm not kidding when I say it's, a, it's over 2,000 years old. Um, many, many centuries before the invention of paper in China, which was circa 105 um, AD or CE, uh, wood was carved and, or bricks were formed or um, other um, clay was, was formed in order to create relief blo blocks that were then used in printing uh, fabrics or branding animals, or branding criminals. You can throw those tomatoes when you're ready, Ron. <laughs> branding criminals. Um, so it wasn't until the introduction of paper that those relief blocks could be used to create what we know now as woodcut prints. Um, some of the earliest areas that, that relief printing were, was used would be in um, ancient Egypt, and Babylonia, and in India. What you see here is called the Diamond Sutra. It's Chinese, circa 1868 AD or CE. Um, it's about 11 inches tall and about 17 feet long, and it's in the collection of the British Museum in London. It's considered to be um, the very first uh, printed woodblock book that's still in existence. And the reason that it actually survived all this time intact uh, is because it was sealed in a secret library in a cave in uh, northwestern China in around um, 1000 CE or AD and was discovered in about 1900, perfectly preserved because of the dry air in that, in that atmosphere. Um, but of course, so many, so many books must have been created before this, woodblock uh, books that have been lost um, because of the fragile um, nature of paper. And so this was, again, this was um, Primarily in the beginning and for, very, for a very long time, wood relief and other relief printing was used to disseminate religious information um, as the Buddhism spread from India. In 1966, the Dharani Sutra in Korea was discovered and it um, was apparently even older than the Diamond Sutra, arguably, by about a hundred years. Um, this, you see, is a replica of it that's in the National Museum of Korea. And it was thought to have been created around 705 to 751 CE or AD. Um, a sutra, by the way, is a holy text, which you all probably know. So there were so many years um, that wood relief printing in the Far East developed, and like so many incredible arts, the Far East, they were well-kept secrets. So it was many, many uh, centuries before European woodcuts achieved a similar level of beauty and proficiency um, that you see in China, India, and Japan. 
One of the very earliest significant European developments um, you see is a fragment of a French wood block, which dates from about circa 1380. Um, we don't have any um, actual prints from it that were uh, contemporary with the block, but people have actually created contemporary um, modern day prints from that fragment of wood. And that's what you see here is the original block of wood, which was carved and then printed more recently. It's uh, known as the bois prota, and it was thought to have been used for printing cloth like they had in ancient Egypt. I'll take questions at the end, but if anyone wants to jump in and say, I have no idea what you're talking about, or, you know, elaborate, blah, 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 feel free. Um, in early 15th century, the locus for production of woodcuts really turned to Germany, and it stayed there for a very long time, as you may know. Uh, it wasn't until er the early 1400s that paper was widely available. It had been invented, but it was, again, not widely available in Europe until that time. Um, so the Center for Woodcut shifted from France to Germany, and it flourished. This is one of the very earliest surviving prints, um, which is called Rest on the Flight to Egypt. It is circa 1410, and it was a black and white woodcut, which was then hand colored. They still hadn't developed the method of multiple block printing. So it would be a very stark black and white with maybe some gradation of shading created through finer lines, but it wasn't a, a, a color uh, wood, woodcut. This would be um, hand printed after the fact. But unlike the Bois Prota, this has a little bit more fluidity of line. One of the difficult things with woodcut is that you must go with the grain. If, um, if you don't, things will splinter. It's wood, so they're developing this. This is in the Albertina in Vienna. Okay, so in medieval Europe, um, relief printing continued to flourish and be the primary way that people disseminated information about religion. Um, but things were also used in a secular manner. Um, apparently, uh, playing cards were a growth industry in medieval Europe, uh, a huge growth industry. Um, these are actually Spanish playing cards. These are um, from 1638, and they're from Seville. Uh, but for the religious work that was um, created in woodcut, it was often um, a way to disseminate information about illuminated manuscripts, which were obviously made by hand, incredibly precious. Um, so they could do a relief print of an image of the manuscript similar to it, and then uh, embellish it with gold leaf or precious stones that would be embedded into the paper or pasted to the paper. I just love the notion of uh, cards as a growth industry. So. There they are. Um, the Diamond Sutra and the Dharani Sutra that you saw at the beginning of the talk, those were both considered block books. Before the invention of movable type, um, the only way to create a book or a page of a book would be to cut it out of an entire block. So you've got the words, you've got the images, all one block, generally speaking. Again, they hadn't invented movable type and they hadn't invented multiple block printing. Um, so what you see here is called is the Annunciation from uh, a work called Biblia um, Papurum, which is Bible of the Poor. It's probably Netherlandish, and from about 1465 or perhaps earlier. This is like so many incredible woodcuts in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of New York. So, hmm. did, I, did I just do two? I might have just done two. Yes, I did. Okay. All right, so woodcut came relatively late to Italy in the 15th century. Um, one of the most beautiful examples is, and I'm going to read this carefully because it's difficult to pronounce, the Hypnerotomachia Polyphili, um, which was written by Francesco Colonna, and uh, the woodcuts were designed by Benedetto Bordone, who is a Padua. This is thought to have been created um, approximately 1499. Is it just the um, illustration that's the block print? Or it's it's both the illustration and the text. Oh, wow. It's both. 
and on each page the text creates this drop shape, very beautiful. And again, this is in the collection of the map. Lucky. And there's still Lucky. Lucky. This is, um, movable print wasn't until the middle of the 15th century, so, you know, this is late 15th. So this may have been actually um, movable type and images. I, sh I should check that, I'm not sure. Okay, so um, from the you know, ancient Egyptian, Babylonian, Indian, origin of relief printing to the close of the 15th century, woodcut was almost exclusively considered utilitarian and graphic. It wasn't considered fine art. It was considered a way to disseminate information, create something cheaply, images for a book, playing cards, holy texts, but it wasn't an elevated fine art. It wasn't until Albrecht Durer, um, who unusually was um, considered a genius by his own contemporaries, which is kind of a refreshing, wonderful thing. Um, it wasn't until he created woodcuts that were multiple block, um, that did have incredible depth and drama, um, that people saw it as fine art. Uh, Durer, um, which is a name I'm sure all of you know, we all know today, was a goldsmith. He was a real you know, Renaissance man, he was a goldsmith, he was a bookmaker, he was a painter, he was a printmaker, and he really elevated the medium. He um, created this piece, this is a series, the Apocalypse series, in 1497 or 98. Um, this is the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, a very light and light-hearted topic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was employed by um, the Habsburg Emperor Maximilian to create several propaganda pictures. Probably the most well-known is this incredible, it, cue the thunder, incredible tri triumphal arch. <laughs> which was created um, using 192 blocks, if you can believe that. And here you see, I wanted you to see the scale, so we've got a person who's, um, who's conserving it and working with it. There's pieces of it are missing here, but she's working with this enormous piece, which measures um, 15, uh, roughly 15 by 11 feet, and is in the British Museum. It's incredible. So it was during the Renaissance, and you can imagine this was um, not something he created by himself, um, that the notion of working with a team, which Dr. Uh, Robert Steen, if you came to his lecture, he talked a bit about this. The artist would draw the work, the artist would oversee the production, the artist would oversee the carving of the various blocks, he would approve them, he would put his stamp on them when they were finished, but he didn't do it alone. And he's, this is certainly the case with Durer with 192 blocks. Uh, I got the measurement wrong. It's about 10 by 9 feet, still huge. And it's not the British Museum, it's the New York Public, New York Public Library. It's in. Um, Durer, <laughs> I love, I had to include this. Durer um, read a description of a rhinoceros that had been given as a gift um, to Germany from India. He'd never seen a rhinoceros, so he created this really fanciful, bizarre, and beautiful um, relief print with lots of curvilinear shapes and odd pieces, and he kind of got it, though, oddly enough, even though he'd never seen a rhino in his life. And this dates from about, ooh, don't do that. <laughs> dates from about 1515. I really feel like I should be saying, it was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> I had to get it out of my system. Okay. <laughs> All right. So in um, Renaissance Germany, again, it remains Germany is the focus for um, relief printing and the, and the energy and, and wonderful production. Um, multiple block printing really started to develop, and Durer is, and, and his contemporaries, such as um, Bergmar and uh, Lucas Kronik, began using the multiple block techniques to produce very dramatic light and shade. Um, what you see here is um, the abbot uh, by, actually by Hans Holbein the Younger. Some of his most important successors were Holbein and um, Albrecht Aldormer and Krayen, who were active in the mid 16th century. Um, the abbot is a woodcut from a series known as the Dance of Death, and Holbein also did an alphabet of death. Very Um, 
okay, so although Germany was the great center of woodcut in the 16th century, there were a great many French and Italian masters. Geoffrey Torrey was a, uh, Torrey was a French printmaker of the period, and Giuseppe Scolari perfected the white line technique, which I'll mention later. Um, it was uh, Tiziano Vecellio, otherwise known as Titian, who um, was one of the very first artists to recognize that he could create a relief print uh, of a painting and then disseminate that to people, um, almost as a form of advertising. But it also was one of the very first forms of edition prints. Um, so this is um, by Titian, Pharaoh's Army Drowned in the Red Sea, 1549, a woodcut made with 12 blocks, which again is in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, it was cut by Domenico D'Alegrecchi. this one. Um, so in the 17th and 18th centuries, woodcut fell away as the relief printing of choice. Um, it continued to develop in, very quietly, primarily in the lowlands. Um, some of the prominent woodcut artists of the time were uh, Goltzius and Levens, and you see this bust of a balding man by the latter. It's a chiaroscuro woodcut with a light brown tone block. A lot of the artists were using, like Titian, were using um, relief printing to show the vigor of their draftsmanship. Um, there were many of them were painters primarily and um, printmakers secondarily. And at this time, it was also used because it was a time of relative decline for woodcut. It was used primarily to illustrate books or magazines, and it really fell out of favor as engraving and etching became more prominent printmaking techniques. But it had a good run, several centuries. And it survived. In uh, the 19th century, how many people recognize this image? It's very recognizable even today. So in Europe and the US, um, again, it was used primarily for book illustration. Um, it was in the, the later 19th century that it um, really started to a resurgence, primarily in England. And Thomas Beswick um, used woodcut. He was from Newcastle. He was a copper plate engraver. Um, but he also um, used a very odd technique of boxwood um, using metal engraving uh, tools. And the boxwood is extremely hard. So he was a very important, this is not an image of his, but I'm telling you, he was a very important um, printmaker at the time because he, uh, um, using that extremely hard wood, was able to create many, many editions of is prints. The softer wood is easier to carve, but the metal tools allow you to carve the harder wood and then you can keep the block longer without having to strike it. Striking it is when you've finished it and it's, it's done. Um, one of the most famous English illustrators at the time was John Tennell, whose illustrations of Alice in Wonderland um, were so powerful that the author Lewis Carroll was said to have rewritten passages of Alice in Wonderland in order to better reflect the illustration. That's quite a collaboration. And they really set the standard today. In the US, uh, two of the most prominent artists in the 19th century using the medium were uh, Thomas Nast, who was a staff illustrator for Harper's Weekly and created political cartoons that were um, very exaggerated, like the tin ale that you just saw, and Winslow Homer, who also worked for Harper's Weekly, and um, he, well, he didn't work for Harper's Weekly, but his woodcuts appeared in Harper's Weekly and other magazines. And he presented an almost romanticized vision of the Civil War. Now, this would have been um, obviously right around 1862, 63, and photography was coming into his own, its own, uh, but many people really couldn't stomach these incredible, powerful images of war that were photographic. Um, so it was a transitional period of the use of relief printing um, in illustration. And it also, as I said, produced a more palatable image. This is a detail from one of his most famous engra uh, not engravings, woodcuts, called uh, Sharpshooter on Picket Duty. Finally, Japanese woodcut. As I said, you, I hope some of you saw Dr. Steen's, uh, heard Dr. Steen's lecture. He went into great de detail about 
Japanese woodcut, and I'm not doing that. I'm giving a little overview of each century, um, but I can't, uh, I can't skip over this. Um, the Great Wave of Kanagawa by Hokusai is one of the most recognizable woodcuts in history. It was uh, from a series of 36 views of Mount Fuji and of uh, the Edo period and was published um, in uh, 1831 or 33. It's a word between there. Um, it wasn't until the 1850s with the advent of Commodore uh, Perry opening Japan to the Western world that that the West became really aware of um, the tradition of Japanese woodcut and it had a resurgence um, because of Japan. Uh, these were Ikkyo-e style prints, which could translate roughly as images of the transient or everyday world. Um, you can see in our hallway some images of uh, courtesans and walking people walking in the snow. These are Ikkyo-e prints. Um, they were particularly influential on artists in Paris. Artists like, uh, that John mentioned in his, John Tilford mentioned in his lecture, like Monet, and many, many artists collected these prints. They didn't all embrace the medium themselves, but they were inspired by the prints. I found it interesting, too, to note that although the Western and Eastern traditions of woodcut developed separately, they developed the technique of multiple block printing and color printing roughly the same time. It was as though it just had its own evolution on both sides of the world. And both also recognized a value of the division of labor in this artist studio with multiple um, uh, jobs for multiple, multiple folks and a team of printers. Another incredibly important um, artist of this period is Hiroshige, whose prints you see flanking the windows here which are part of our permanent collection, and were given in memory of Professor Ron Carlyle, who was, uh, as I understand it, a Renaissance man himself, and very important to OU. This is, I'll tell you my favorite, Yoshida. Um, he, um, Yoshida's prints you see in the other gallery, if you haven't seen them, if you're coming here for the first time, please take some time after the lecture and have a look. We have 28 beautiful color prints by Hiroshi Yoshida on view in the other gallery, um, courtesy of the Taylor family. Uh, these were also a team effort. However, Yoshida was particularly painstaking, as described by his sons, <laughs> um, in the process and overseeing every detail. Um, he felt he had to exceed uh, the ability of anyone in his studio um, in order to ensure quality. So he would not only design the key block from the uh, initial illustration, but he would alternate tasks in the studio. So sometimes he'd be mixing pigments and sometimes he would be cutting blocks and he was involved at every step. Um, his color woodcuts, which were often at least 12 to 15 different blocks, would also include, I'm gonna read this carefully, a nuzu, <laughs> no, I'm not gonna read it carefully, I'm gonna read it again an Izumibun, or a gray color block, which created a very deep shadow effect, a real deep chiaroscuro or dimension, um, which I think is particularly evident in this beautiful print. Um, and he would occasionally combine woodcut with other printmaking techniques, like zinc plate, uh, which has a much sharper line. Um, he really used all different sorts of media uh, to his advantage. This beautiful print is uh, the very last woodcut that he created in 1947 or 46 when he was 72. Um, and I just, as you look at it, you'll have to see the original version that we have in the other room, the smoke coming up from the fire. Who does that with a woodcut? It's astounding. And the view into the outside world, um, it looks to me like uh, a last passage, like a farewell, and it's just incredible the softness and the precision. Okay, so in the late 19th century, um, as I said, a lot of uh, artists in the West were inspired by the Japanese woodcuts and collected the Japanese woodcuts, but they didn't create things in that media. Two who did were Gauguin and uh, Monk. Uh, Parisian Paul Gauguin, who was, as many of you know, um, very, very interested in, um, in uh, the creation of, of 
woodcuts and also beautiful, beautiful, um, uh, very colorful paintings. Um, created this woodcut in 1893 or 94. Uh, it's called uh, Nave Nave Finua or Delightful Land. It's printed on wove paper lined in silk, so he was really embracing the medium. And at the time, too, you can see that um, those who were working with the medium were trying to bring it back to its roots. So they were allowing you to see the, the wood grain, and they were bringing it up to the fore and letting it be really literally rough hewn. Um, Norwegian Edvard Munch, I don't have a beautiful, beautiful image here, unfortunately, it's a little blurred, I apologize, I realized this when I queued it up. Um, he also embraced the medium and the wood grain effect. Um, you may have seen his famous kiss, he did a number of woodcuts of that, and the grain is extremely prominent. This would be from about 1901, and is in the collection of the British Museum, among others. In the early 20th century, again, we're back to Germany. Um, that was, again, the center of energy and production for woodcut. Some of the prominent relief printers in this period were uh, Emil Nolde, whose work you see here. This is The Prophet from 1912, and Ernst um, Kirchner. So the German expressionists, um, they wanted uh, the images to look organic. They wanted them to look bold. They wanted them to look guttural and, and uh, visceral, and woodcut was a really, really good min uh, medium to convey those sort of rough, ready, uh, emotional images. They worked well. This is just a gorgeous, gorgeous print. This is um, Ernst Ludwig Kirchner, again, he's German. It's Winter Moonlit Night, dated around 1919. But you can see again all of the, it's very roughly done, the edges and all of that. Okay, this is not a woodcut, <laughs> but who knows who this is? It's, it's Picasso. Pablo Picasso, who um, was the master of so many different media, uh, and arguably the, one of the most incredible artists who's walked the earth, um, also embraced woodcut, but he preferred linocut, and linoleum became, was in production by the mid-20th century. Um, and the same linoleum that you would use to, you know, put down on your kitchen floor, um, artists who will use anything they can, because they're crazy like that, took linoleum blocks and attached them to plywood and carved. And one of the beautiful things about it is it didn't have a grain, so you could carve in any direction, have tremendous fluidity. Um, so uh, Picasso, although he knew all the rules of every media that he probably ever touched, loved to break rules, and so he carved linoleum. This is uh, called Picador, and it's from 1959. You can also see his fascination with African work in that print. Does anybody recognize who this is? I just love this guy, Leonard Baskin. So, you know, the tradition of wood relief um, is never going to reach the zenith that it did in the 16th and century, uh, 17th centuries in Europe. Um, but a lot of modern and contemporary artists, a lot of Americans have embraced this medium. Leonard Baskin is one. Um, others include Roy Lichtenstein, Luigi Reese, Terry Winters, Blanche Lazelle, Helen Frankenthaler, Gustav Baumann, Joel Shapiro, Elizabeth Catlett, Francis Gerhardt, Jim Dine, the list goes on and on and on. I'm just going to give you a couple of um, examples here. Elizabeth Catlett, uh, Sharecropper from 1968. If you're not familiar with her work, check it out. She's amazing, a master of woodcut. Um, white lime woodcut was, um, it had been used. I mentioned it earlier, um, but it wasn't a choice, it wasn't a primary choice. Um, and done in this manner, um, it, 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 let me rephrase, this, this sort of use of white line woodcut was new. It was new to uh, early 20th century US. Um, other, other engraving of wood blocks uh, with that kind of line had been done in Europe, but um, they were multiple blocks. 
the white line woodcuts that were done by Provincetown, um, Massachusetts printmakers, including Lynch uh, Lizelle, um, were a single block with multiple colors. So what they would literally do, and if we have time and I can cue this up, I'm going to show you a little demonstration of it. Um, they would create a, a groove between each area of color, and that groove became the white line. Um, because the notion of relief printing is that anything that is carved away is background, um, the surface is the relief. So they would ink them up section by section by section by section by section. Contemporary Japanese woodcut. Uh, this is by um, Hiratsuka Omichi, and it's a woodcut of the Library of Congress, and it is in the collection of the Library of Congress. It's from 1966. Um, he uh, was born in Japan, but lived the second half of his life in the Washington, D.C. area. So you're bringing together, like Yoshida, um, who traveled the world, uh, images of other areas of the world, but with a Japanese sensibility. Other contemporary Japanese woodcut artists uh, include um, Keiji Shinohara, Monokata Shiko, and um, Hashikuchi, ah, pronounce it correctly, Elizabeth, Hashikuchi Goyo, who's woman after a bath, I'm going to show you, which obviously is very influenced by Japanese tradition, but with some changes. The woman is completely nude. Um, this is from 1920, colored woodblock print, a woman after bath. See, I put this in here as a, a little connector, but I have to actually cue it up for you. What I'm going to do is just take you through first um, this, and then if we have a minute, what time do we have? Are we all right? We're good. We're good. We're fine. Um, what I'll do is show you this, and then I'll see if I can cue up a couple demonstrations. You can see the actual carving of a block. They're very brief. Um, we have a little beautiful book that the tailors loaned to us and uh, showed it to a number of people here um, that shows you page by page how the block is actually built up. I know we have some printmakers in the audience, but we probably also have folks who have never done this before. It's, um, if you've ever made a potato print as a child, you carve a little potato, you ink it up, that's relief printing. It's as simple as that, which is why it's so, um, it's been around for so long. This beautiful little book, um, let me the page here was published by um, Nakazawa of Tokyo. He produced a number of small books in the middle of the 20th century um, that illustrate the process of color wood cut uh, using original prints. Um, this is using a print by Hiroshige. So what does he say here? The order of printing is decided by the color and spaces, starting with lighter colors. Um, the exact placing of each color is important. So everything must be on register for each color, or you get a unintentional Andy Warhol effect. If you want that, that's great. But if you don't, you need to have things registered properly. Um, so the the water would there would actually be water placed on the um, paper. It's watered down. It's tamped down over the block with what's called a baron, which is in this case usually made of a bamboo sheath. Um, some people doing a color white line would cut would use the back of a spoon. It's something that could just burnish down your print. So each time you do a new color, see this is the key block. It's just black and white from the line drawing. And you see on the right, the build up, that, that kind of reddish color is, is not true. It's my inability to be a photographer. But you see the blue of that square and the two little figures, they're blue. That's a separate block. So there's the key block, and there's this one, there are 12 for this one. There's a completely separate block just to shade in the mountains. But you can see it on the left building up, on the right. This really, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, explains so much about color woodcut. There's the gray block, a black block, yellow, red, the sea building up slowly, the mountains until you have the final. It's quite amazing. But um, when you look at these things, if you haven't experienced or understood the complexity of woodcut, I you know, think you'll see it through a different lens. So let me see now if I can cue up one of these. I'll pick one. <laughs> this is Ruth Hogan for the, um, I believe it's the Cleveland Museum of Art, demonstrating a white line woodcut technique. 
Hold on one sec. She demonstrates a little bit. She also just talks about the technique. And again, this is the um, white line technique. This is showing you that she's using both the front and back of the block. So you sketch it actually onto the wood and then cut into the wood, cut each little white line as a section. It's a sign of me. There she's again, she's doing the, you can see she's got it at an angle, 45 degree angle, and she's creating the wood line, the white line. And they, they're deceptively simple looking, but again, these are each each color area is separate. So you have to be really carefully inked. And they're usually done in fewer editions. Okay. Do you have any questions or questions, comments? Yeah. The uh, professional graphic designer sitting next to me reminded me that when you are doing text, it's all reversed. Oh, right, absolutely. So, <laughs> I think they would normally, um, you, you might do a transfer technique, it depends. You, I mean, you may be able to speak to this, to this better than I can. I have, uh, in full disclosure, I've done um, lithography and a little bit of le uh, relief printing, and this would have been about 25 years ago. So, <laughs> but you know, switching ads, I must talk about all these different techniques. Um, no, it, it's the reverse. It's the reverse. In some instances, you'll see um, in a lot of different print media, um, the artist is signed uh, within the plate, um, and it's reversed. They may just allow it to be that way, um, or they may try to um, they create the image and then do a transfer of that image so that you can see what it will look like in advance. Um, another thing that's important to note is that artists will do a proof. So you'll see AP, artist proof, um, to see what that print will look like before they commit to an addition. Um, it's kind of nice to have it as a silent movie. Other questions or comments? Did I get that about right since you're a print maker? I'm not a print maker. Oh, okay, but you're a graphic designer. Right. Anybody else? When they apply the color, do they do it with a, a brush or do they do it with a pencil? They will, you know what I'll do is I'll try to show you, let's see if I can find another one. No, um, yeah, I'll just explain it. Um, it depends. Uh, it's usually not a brush. You want a very even application of the ink, so you'll use a tiny roller. And it's, um, it's almost a question of the sound of the ink and the stickiness of it to get it prepared. You're, you've probably done some printmaking. Um, the a few times I've done printmaking, it feels to me almost like baking bread. You've got to have this sort of rhythm. You've got to follow the rhythm and allow the media to do what it does. Um, so you will use your, usually a piece of glass, uh, so you have an incredibly smooth, even surface, and um, you take your, is it called rayer, is that right? That's what I'm remembering. And you roll that to smooth out the ink and get it very kind of viscous and smooth. And then you'll roll it on as evenly as you can, because you don't want it to fall into the grooves that you cut away. Yeah, any other good questions? Anybody, anybody? Well, anybody who'd like to, you know, take your time. We have plenty of things to do to kind of clean up, and if you want to wander around, and I don't hear any more horrible <laughs> crashing booms or anything, so you probably get out of here safely. But take your time and uh, have a look around. Thank you.